Hi, I'm Will Goldsmith. This module introduces the various layers of the U.S. educational system. The point of it is to see the bones of the system, and then we'll flesh out the rest of it in other modules. Here's a chart that shows the U.S. educational system. It looks pretty complex, right? What we're going to do is we're going to walk through the major parts of this system and how they came to be. How we got to such a complex seeming system. A system that seems, to me, even more complex than it looks like right here. The reason for that is, when I was growing up, my parents had very few choices about what school I was going to go to. I grew up in rural North Carolina, and where we grew up, the only choices that my parents really had to make were, one, was I going to go to a preschool? Two, was I going to go to the public school, or was I going to go to the private Christian school in town? And three, where was I going to go to college? That was it. It was pretty basic. For me, when I consider how I'm going to educate my three-year-old daughter, I have this host of questions I have to face. What am I going to do when it comes to her public school? Are we going to go to the neighborhood school? Are we going to go to the Montessori school? Are we going to get into a lottery for a charter across town? Then, after we get through elementary school, we faced another host of choices when it comes to her high school education. Do we go to the arts school? Do we try to go to a science school? Do we try to go to one of the private schools around town and jump from the public to the private system then? It seems so very complicated to make these choices in our modern day educational system. These are the personal choices that my family has to make in the system, but this layers of this educational system also present a host of complicated public policy questions, which, though complicated, we can largely boil down to two questions. How do we expand access to various aspects of the system? Today, mostly, how do we expand access to college? Uh, and two, how do we increase the quality of each of these components of the system? How do we make sure that pre-K, that elementary school, that high school educations are really doing the job that we want them to do? in order to prepare young people for the economy of today, the economy of the future. Okay, we're going to start with a really basic timeline. The point of this timeline is not so that you memorize very, very specific dates, but instead so that you get a relative understanding of how these systems came into place. Starting with the common school movement. Now, it's easy to think of the American school system as becoming even more complex over time, but if we look at the, the common school movement, part of what it was trying to do was to try to simplify what was becoming at that time, which is in the 1830s and 40s, becoming a very fragmented American educational system. We had a growing number of charity schools. We had a growing number of tuition academies. We had a growing number of rural school systems that were operated by local communities. Each of these with their different religious groups often who were running them, with their different pedagogies, with their different emphasis. Horace Mann, who was one of the founding fathers of the American educational system, saw this fragmented system and he persuaded the Massachusetts legislature in the 1840s to fund a common school system in that state. Let's go back to the words of Horace Mann as he describes this common school system. He wants to create an education system as was common in the highest sense, as the air and light were common, because it was not only the cheapest but the best, not only accessible to all, but as a general rule enjoyed by all. Notice that he wants to create this system that is not only a great system, but that is a system that is accessible. He wants both excellence and equality when it comes to the common school system. And that's an ongoing theme and an ongoing tension that we see in the school systems as they build out, as we get the various layers of the American educational system. The common school movement sweeps the nation, and that's what gives us all those one-room schoolhouses all across the nation. These build out first in the North and the Midwest, and after the Civil War, we see them increasingly in the South. Now, in the South, that's where we have to particularly think about and try to understand the history of race and education in the United States. In the South, after Reconstruction, as white redeemers take back control of the governments of these states, we don't see much funding for public education for African Americans. That's one reason why we see the rise of philanthropists from the North, people like Julius Rosenwald, a Sears and Roebuck tycoon, who creates the Rosenwald Fund, a matching grant program whereby African Americans can raise local money supported by the Rosenwald Fund in addition to some state tax money to build schools for African Americans across the South. This chart shows the long catching up that has to take place in terms of school enrollment for African Americans in the U.S. 
Eventually, it does catch everybody, but it's really not until after the civil rights movement that we see those lines really come together. Starting around the 1890s, we add in the high school layer. And again, part of what the high school is doing is simplifying something that is actually a little bit more fragmented and complex. With the high school, we're trying to bring under one roof a whole host of social classes, but while under that roof, educate them for different purposes. Another reason we're getting the high school is because urban working class parents want a leg up for their children. Now remember, in the late 19th century, that's when we have the growth of the industrial economy. That's where we have the decline of the artisanally skilled laborers. And what these working class urban parents need is some other way to give some sort of advantage to their children. And so we have the pressures from below. We have the administrative progressives trying to come up with a new solution for a lot of these social dislocations that are happening. One of which is the rise of compulsory education as one way of dealing with the child labor problem. So those things go hand in hand. Now if we look back at this chart, we see around 1915, which is roughly the start of World War I, we see how few people in the United States are receiving even some high school, much less a high school diploma. But as you see that trend line, we see how that is gradually increasing over the course of the early 20th century. Now it's really after World War II when we start seeing the rise of mass education when it comes to college. Part of the reason for that is the GI Bill, which funds veterans who are coming back home from the war who want to go on and further their education. That's what provides a big wave of enrollment in the late 1940s and 1950s, which comes along with the second GI Bill and the Korean War. And then as the baby boom generation comes of age, we have the Great Society programs that help provide even more financing for higher education uh, so that people can get the loans they need in order to pay for it. If we go back to this chart showing how the layers of the educational system are building in, we see how that swath of people who are college enrolled and completing college are increasing over time. The question is, as we build these layers, are we doing them because we need to do them in order to operate in this increasingly complex society? Or are we doing this as some sort of rat race where each time that we build some sort of universal education system, a group of people tries to shoot out in front and get some sort of other educational credential that's going to signal to the labor market that they should be paid more or they should get the better jobs in our society. As we become a society more on the service side rather than the manufacturing side, what does that mean for everybody who can't become an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor? What does that mean for people who are going to become janitors or even plumbers in some sort of skilled trade? How can we balance the equality involved in this situation versus the excellence we want to have in our education system? These are questions we're going to think about as we move forward in this series.